Hello and welcome to the Essex Boys Murder Case Part 53. Before watching this video, I recommend watching Part 4 on YouTube first, as these videos are all about the key individuals and the murder victims movements on the day of the 6th of December 1995. A quick mention to the Facebook page called The Real Essex Boys Murder Club. If you're interested, please feel free to join as some great people on there with a lot of knowledge on this subject. So this is the fifth part of the Steve Nipper Ellis revelations video based on if Nipper's dad Sid committed the Essex boys murders. I'm going to carry on through the questions and answers video he did on YouTube um, but before I carry on, I would just like to give you a quick catch up on the early videos I made based on the Steve Nipper Ellis revelations. In part one, I looked into the statement from an Alan Grayston and what he said he saw on the 4th of December, which was two days before the executions. He saw a suspicious male in a field next to the farm track with a pair of binoculars heading towards a white BMW that was parked at the entrance of the track. In part two, I looked into the possibility Nipper Ellis could have made the journey from Swanage in Dorset to Rettenden on the 4th of December after attending his local police station, which he had to do on a daily basis due to his bail conditions. Then doing a recce in the Redden area, then setting off back to Swanage to pick up his girlfriend at the time from the railway station after she'd finished at college for the day. In part three and four, I went through some of the questions and answers interview Nipper did for Bullet Productions on YouTube to see if I could find out if he was lying or telling the truth. So on with part five of the Steve Nipper Ellis revelations and before I do start I'd just like to say a big thank you to Bullet Productions for allowing me to use their material for this video. Also I am in no way a, a lie detector expert. I have however looked into deceptions by experts during interviews and I'm using their techniques in this video. So this is the first clip I'd like you to watch. This is a question everyone wants to know. Who killed Pat, Tony and Craig? My dad. I'll tell you what happened. As people know, my, my family were under a, um, so the interviewer asks the question, so who killed Pat, Tony and Craig? Notice after the interviewer asks this question, there's a long pause from Nipper Ellis, then he looks away. I mean, the interviewer really wants to know his answer. There is long eye contact between the two. And now Nipper should have answered this question straight away at this point, but he doesn't. He can't answer whilst there's eye contact from the interviewer. When I replay this clip, notice Nipper looks away before answering this question. Now when to tell if someone is lying, look at facial clues. If someone stares at you or looks away at a crucial moment, these are big indicators that someone is lying or about to lie. Another clue when someone is lying is that they tend to blink rapidly. Notice in this short clip after the question, and long pause, Nipper looks away, then you can see him rapidly blinking. 
So when I replay this clip, look for the stare from both the interviewer and Nipper. Because he really wants to know this answer. Nipper should be able to give him the answer right at this point. He has no reason to pause. Whilst there's eye contact, he should be able to tell him the truth at this crucial moment in time. But he doesn't. Look for the long pause Nipper does. Straight after that pause, look for Nipper looking away, then looking at him blinking rapidly. Right, I will replay the clip a few times as it's such a short clip. This is a question everyone wants to know. Who killed Pat, Tony and Craig? My dad. I'll tell you what happened. See what happened, right? As people know, final question. This is a question everyone wants to know. Who killed Pat, Tony, and Craig? My dad. I see what happened, right? As people. Now, to me, when Nipper is asked the question by the interviewer, who killed Pat, Tony and Craig, he won't give the interviewer his answer straight away. He stares instead. He then looks away at the crucial moment and then there's rapid blinking. All signs of someone lying and not telling the truth. So this is a deception indicated on more than one occasion in this clip. So moving on, and this is the second clip I want to show you. After Colton, I spoke to Colton and told him to shoot me in the head. All right, um, he got them off my family, yeah, and I was told to leave town. But the thing was, if they called me, they would still they would take my arms and legs off, but they would kill me. So would you make sure they kill me? Because if they don't, even if I'm in a wheelchair, I wouldn't kill them because it's a shit. My old man was still getting grief a couple of days before they got killed, or a week before they got killed. He said he was walking up the street, and somebody drove past and shouted out, Get us, you piece of shit, we're going to get you. Talking to my dad. They knew where he lived. So anyway, go for so, in this clip, Nipper talks about Carlton Leach asking him to get them off his back. Now, when he's talking about this, there's lots of eye contact to the interviewer from Nipper, and he's speaking fluently throughout this clip. Also, Carlton Leach is still alive, so he could back Nipper up if this is what happened, or... If Carlton Leach wanted to, he could just easily say um, Nipper is lying about the conversation they had um, about sorting out the feud. Um, as far as I know, Carlton Leach has never denied these conversations um, happening between the two. Um, Nipper would have a lot to lose in this part of the story if he was lying about it so to me in this part of the clip i'd say nipper ellis is telling the truth and i will replay the uh, clip for you after colton i spoke to colton and told him to shoot me in the head all right um he got them off my family yeah and i was told to leave town but the thing was, if they called me, they would still they would take my arms and legs off, but they would kill me. So would you make sure they kill me? Because if they don't, even if I'm in a wheelchair, I wouldn't kill them because it's a shit. My old 
man was still getting grief a couple of days before they got killed, or a week before they got killed. He said he was walking up the street and somebody drove past and shouted out, hey, this you piece of shit, we're going to get you. Talking to my dad. They knew where he lived. So anyway. So, moving on, and this is the third clip I want to uh, show you. Go forward a few months. Um, Damon Alvin, the grass on uh, Ricky's place. A really good friend of mine, who was very close to my dad, knew that Damon was getting involved with a deal that was going to happen at the Redding Turnpike. So Damon was told by a really good friend, who I'm not going to name, because his family won't want to name for her. Damon told my really good friend about he was going to meet with Pat, Tony and Craig. My good friend told my dad. So my dad and my good friend pumped Damon for the information. Yeah. The deal was, it had already happened anyway, in this field at Redenham, there had already been a drop. Come over from now, when Nipper Ellis is giving his version of events of what happened at the White House farm track and the build up to the murders, he says Damon had put a deal together with the Essex boys at the Rettenden Turnpike. Now, it's a roundabout. I mean, why not say? Damon had put a deal together with the Essex boys at a lane or farm track in Rettenden. I personally find Nipper saying a deal was going to be done at a roundabout just a little bit odd. Now the next part of this clip I want to talk about is when Nipper's talking about a meeting that will be taking place between Damon Alvin and the Essex boys. Now he says to the interviewer, Damon told my really good friend that he was going to meet with Pat, Tony and Craig. My good friend told my dad. So my dad and my good friend pumped Damon for the information. Okay, when I replay the clip, watch what he does at the end of the sentence I have just spoken about. Right at the end when he says, So my dad and my good friend pumped Damon for the information. And after he says this, he puts his lips in. He's pushing both lips into his mouth. It's at about 49 minutes, 28 seconds or so. If you want to replay it a couple of times yourself on the Bullet Productions video. Um, now, this is a sign that someone is lying. When someone puts their lips back to the point where they almost disappear. Nipper Ellis clearly does this in this clip. At around 49 minutes, 28 seconds, you can clearly see him do this. After he does this with his lips, he says something to the interviewer. Listen to him say, all right. Now he says this to the interviewer because he wants him to believe the story so far. He's trying to convince him he's telling the truth. He says, all right, a few times near the end of this video when telling the interviewer his version of events that happened that night. I mean, Nipparellis probably didn't even realise he was doing this. And it is a common slip up. Um, I will now replay the clip. So anyway, go forward a few months. Um, Damon Alvin, the grass on uh, Ricky's place. A really good friend of mine, who was very close to my dad, 
know that Damon was getting involved with the deal that was going to happen at the Retton Turnpike. So Damon was told by a really good friend, who I'm not going to name, because his family won't want to name for her. Damon told my really good friend about he was going to meet with Pat, Tony and Craig. My good friend told my dad. So my dad and my good friend come to Damon for the information. The deal was, it had already happened anyway, in this field at Rettendon, there had already been a... Now, having watched this particular clip quite a few times, and from Nipper's body language and facial clues, I've come to the conclusion that there is a deception indicated and he's not telling the truth. So, moving on, and the next clip I want to show you is this one. So Pat, Tony and Craig had got to know about it. They were part of the deal. So Damon had met with Pat, Tony and Craig and said he can sort it out. How, how much he can sort it out, I don't know. Right? I didn't know about it until afterwards. Right? My dad told me what happened. He didn't tell me because I knew I wouldn't have wanted it. I wouldn't have wanted him involved, which, I, which when he told me, I, I was a bit funny, either. I was, I was crying down the phone and I said, Basically, Damon put the deal together, right? My mate, who I'm not going to say, told my dad. So my mate and my dad, that night, they took, well, they did, my dad went up there, right? So, so, just a couple of things I want to pick up on in this clip. Uh, the first being when Nipper's telling the interviewer the part about the call between him and his dad. Now he's literally about to go into detail about the telephone conversation, then stops. Why does he do this? This could have been an important part of his version of events, but he chooses not to tell the interviewer. Um, I just find that part of the clip strange. Uh, the second part of this clip I want to mention is when he's telling the story of Damon Alvin. Now he says, Damon put the deal together. My mate, who well, I'm not going to say, told my dad. So my mate and my dad, that night, they took. Well, my dad went up there, right? Now in that sentence, he said, took. Damon put the deal together. My mate, who I'm not going to say, told my dad. So my mate and my dad, that night, they took. They took what? What is he on about here? It's a very strange thing to say. I mean, straight after saying that, he quickly says, Well, my dad went up there. In his version of events, he's trying, uh, he, is he trying uh, uh, to keep his dad's accomplice out of the crime by saying they took? Then realising he slipped up, he changes it to, well, my dad went up there. I mean, if Nipper's version of events are true, then what did they take up? They took my dad's car up there. They took my mate's car up there. They took the guns up there. I mean, he soon changes his mind and says, well, my dad went up there. I mean, that's, that's very strange. What will you, what you'll hear at the end of the clip is Nipper Ellis using the word right again at the end um, to convince uh, the interviewer, he's telling the truth and wants him to believe him by repeating this word as he's telling him his version of events. Um, I will replay uh, the clip again. So 
Pat, Tony and Craig had got to know about it. They were in part of the deal. So Damon had met with Pat, Tony and Craig and said he can sort it out. How, how much he can sort it out, I don't know. But I didn't know about it until afterwards. Right, my dad told me what happened. He didn't tell me because I knew I wouldn't have wanted it. I wouldn't have wanted him involved, which, I, which when he told me, I, I was in front of him. I was, I was crying down the phone and I said, basically, Damon put the deal together, right? My mate, who I'm not going to say, told my dad. So my mate and my dad, that night, they took, well, they did, my dad went up there, right? So Damon's in the car while he's in the Range Rover with Pat, Tony, and Craig. Now I've watched these clips over and over again and I've got to be honest, when Nipper Ellis has given his version of events on what happened that night in Rettenden, he starts to give details on what happened but tends to change words or phrases. I mean he's just done it in the last clip. Damon put the deal together. My mate, who I'm not going to say, told my dad. So my mate and my dad, that night, they took, well, my dad went up there that night. I mean, he also starts to talk about the telephone conversation um, he and his dad apparently had when he told his son what ha had happened in Rettenden that night, but stops and begins talking about something else. I find it strange why, why he does this. So that's it for part five of the Steve Nipper Ellis Revelations videos. Uh, there will be a part six, uh, which will be the last one. And I will be going through more of the questions and answers videos he made on YouTube. And I will give you a summing up on the Steve Nipper Ellis uh, Revelations. I would like to say a big thank you to Bullet Productions for letting me use their material uh, for this video. It is much appreciated. Um, if you believe Nipper's version events or not, um, it is good to see him talking about his experience uh, with the Essex Boys. Uh, YouTube subscribers, I hope you've enjoyed the video and it shouldn't be too long before part six is ready. Um, don't forget, you can join the Real Essex Boys Murder Club on Facebook. Uh, we have new posts going on on a daily basis. Um, we have over 30,000 members, so there's lots of people to talk to on there about this case. Um, all we ask is respect to the people's opinions on there, as we all have our own theories on what we think happened uh, that night. Um, if you subscribe to my channel, you'll get to watch my videos first, as I don't... Um, upload them on the Facebook group for at least uh, a week or so later. So if you want to watch my videos first, um, subscribe and you'll get a notification as soon as I upload, um, upload them. Um, so that's it. Thanks for watching and until next time, take care.